here we are now in chapter three. And so chapter three is gonna be over polynomial and rational functions. So before we get to polynomials, the first one we wanna to get to is the quadratics. So a regular polynomial equation um, will have some coefficient and then it'll have x to some power and then the power will start going down until you get to squared, an exponent of one, and then an exponent of zero, which means there's no x's. And then again, each term will have its own coefficient. That's what a represents, is the coefficient. So for the first one here in the polynomials, it says um, f of x equals two, and that is called a constant, coefficient, a constant function. So it's just this term by itself. Okay, and that one's considered um, to have an exponent of x to the zero, right? And then what is a leading coefficient? Well, the coefficient in front of that is just two. Now, when you have just x to the power one, so now you're talking about a function that just has these two terms, okay? And in that case, it's called a linear exponent is 1 and degree is the highest exponent of the polynomial so here you have x to the 1 and here you have a constant which is like x to the 0 but the highest exponent there is 1 and that's why the degree is 1 and then what's the leading coefficient if the degree is 1 then you need to be looking at the x that has that exponent and then its coefficient now this kind of function where you have a square is called the quadratic and the highest exponent here is going to be x to the power 2 so 2 is the degree here and what is the coefficient in front of that term with the x to the 2 it is a 4 this is called a cubic function when the highest exponent is 3 because the highest exponent is 3 um, that's why the degree is 3. And then what is the coefficient of the term that has x to the power 3? That coefficient is a positive 2. Now here we have a, a quartic is what it's called, a quartic function. And the highest exponent here is actually a 4. And what is the coefficient that's in front of that? It's actually an invisible 1. So what is a quadratic function then? It's basically just these three terms without the rest of the higher exponents. So you have some coefficient times x squared plus some coefficient times b plus c and a cannot equal zero because if this guy is zero then you won't have a squared and it has to have a square in order for it to be considered a quadratic. Okay, you could be missing this term or you could be missing that term, but you can't be missing the square or it's not considered a quadratic. And so the quadratic generally has the shape of what's called a parabola. And so what that means is it looks like kind of like a U with arrows, or if it's a flipped upside down, then looks kind of like a hill, right? And in these images, you have what are called here, if it, it's going upward, this is a minimum. And if it's going downward, then this is a maximum. But in either case, that point there is what's called a vertex. Okay, so it's basically like the center of the polynomial. Now here, it's telling us that the, if you have a polynomial written in this form, you can use a bunch of algebra to solve here or to try to manipulate this and you end up with this expression here this is a pretty complicated expression so um, what you need to memorize is that x minus the x value here is um, negative b over 2a because it's negative right um, 
Actually, I think I forgot to put the minus in there. There we go. And then um, this expression here, you don't need to memorize because you can get this expression by taking negative b over 2a and plugging it in for x. And if you simplify that, you end up getting this kind of expression, okay? And so normally that value over there is called f of negative b over 2a. So instead of writing this complicated thing and that complicated thing, what they do is instead of writing negative b over 2a, they write an h. And instead of writing this fraction over here, they write a k. And then they just tell the reader that that h is actually negative b over 2a. And that k can be found by plugging the h value you get into the function. Okay. Now the parabola will have a vertex at this point, h comma k. And it's easier to look at this than it is to look at this x value comma that y value, right? So that's why they change the variables and they just give you a shortcut on how to calculate those variables. Now, x equals h as an axis. So remember, I mentioned that the vertex is going to be the center of the polynomial and that's what the axis is. So the axis is like an invisible line that is the center of the um, polynomial. And notice that the polynomial should be symmetric around that particular axis. Now, the graph will open up, or the parabola will open up, if this number in front is a positive. But if that number in the front is a negative, then it'll open downward like this. And the graph is wider if a is less than 1, and it's narrower if a is greater than 1. Okay, So wider meaning that if a is less than 1, it'll be like this. And then narrower means it'll be more skinny like that. Okay. And then the intercept is going to be 0 comma c. So when I find the y-intercept, you always plug in 0 for x. And if I did that, this term would be 0, that term would be 0. And I'd just be left with the c value there. How do you find the x-intercepts? You have to solve that quadratic equal to 0. And that would give you the x-intercepts. And you could try to factor it, or you could just use the quadratic formula, and you'll get it. You'll get the, that x value, and then comma the 0 for the y. Um, this is just coincidence. If what's inside the square root happens to be 0, then this whole term is gone, and you literally have negative b over 2a, comma 0. And then if what's inside there is negative, that would mean it's imaginary. And you can't graph imaginary things as an intercept. So in that case, there would be no x-intercepts. So let's use that information there, and let's do one example. Here, originally in the paperwork, just wanted me to find the axes and the vertex of the parabola, but I noticed that um, the homework section asked you for all of the information. So we're going to go ahead and try to do all of that with this problem. And it looks like a lot, but it's really not going to take that much um, to work on. So let's look here. It says find the axes. And honestly, you probably want to do all this stuff on your paper first and then go in and um, enter in the information. Okay. So especially this one, you definitely want to do this first before you try to find domain, range, um, intervals of increasing and intervals of decreasing. So it says find the axes of the vertex. Well, we know that the axes of the vertex is going to be x equal to h. And we have a formula on how to calculate h. h is going to be negative b over 2a. And so in this case, my a is negative 3, my b is 12, and my c is negative 8. So I need only the b and then 2 times a. So I get negative 12 over negative 6, which is positive 2. So that's going to be my axes. So if I draw an image over here, 
that's where that center of the parabola is going to be. Now, I'm going to find the vertex. And the vertex is h comma k. Now I already know what h is, right? h is equivalent to all these things, so I already know that h is equal to 2. How do I find k? I need to find f of h, which means f of 2. And how do you calculate f of 2? You plug 2 into the function. So negative 3 times 2 squared, 12 times 2 minus 8 and I get 4 so the vertex is going to be 2 comma 4 and so then if I graph that it's going to be this spot here and notice that A is negative, which means it's going to be opening downward, okay? But I don't know where it's going to touch the x-axis, so I do have to find the x-intercepts, which is actually this step, okay? So to find the x-intercepts, remember you've got to take that whole polynomial function and set it equal to zero. And how do you solve um, this quadratic equal to zero, you use your um, quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. So I get negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 12 squared minus 4 times negative 3 times negative 8 and then the square root of 48 can actually be simplified and then this can actually be simplified So I get x equals a positive 2 plus or minus, um, and it actually stays plus or minus because a positive divided by a negative is a negative, and a negative divided by a negative is a positive. So the sign will still stay the same, but the 4 and the 6 will reduce to 2 and 3. And these 3's cannot cancel, right, because this one's inside the square root and that one is not inside the square root. So that's great that's what it that's what i would type in the computer is i would type 2 plus or minus 2 square root of 3 over 3 comma 0 or separate them right one of these expressions with the plus sign in the middle and then another one with the minus sign in the middle but as far as graphing them i am going to need to figure out what the heck that looks like so fraction 2 square root of 3 over 3 oops If I use the positive, I get 3.1, about 3.15. And then if I do the expression again, but put a minus sign, let me change it to a decimal, I get about 0 0.85. So that helps me when I'm trying to graph it. So even though I can give... Um, the computer the exact versions of the answers um, I want to use the decimals to try to draw it on my paper now um, I believe in my math lab all you have to do is like select the problem that looks closest to yours so it's best if you draw it by hand so that way you know whether or not it looks um, similar to yours or not and so you can see the placement of the x-intercepts So there's my x-intercepts and I've continued the um, graph.
So this is the graph. And these are the x-intercepts. So I've done the intercepts, the graph, and I've done the, vert the axes and the vertex. There's three things that I haven't done, right? I haven't done all the intervals. So for the domain, how far left does it go? Remember, this is going down and to the left forever, so negative infinity. This one's going down, but to the right forever. And domain is from left to right. Now range is from the bottom to the top. So these are both going down to negative infinity. But how high does it go? It only goes up to this value, which is a four. And there is a solid dot there, so I should be putting a bracket. So now I've done domain and I've done range. Now for intervals of increasing, Notice that if I trace it from the left to the right, it's going up, 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 up until it reaches here. So um, intervals of increasing is going to be from negative infinity all the way to the left to four. But remember, intervals of increasing and decreasing always have parentheses. And then now if I want my intervals of decreasing, that would be from this spot going that way. So the left uh, x value here is going to be two. And then if I keep going, 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 it's gonna eventually go to a positive infinity x value. And again, this should always have parentheses on intervals of increasing and decreasing. So now I've done those two parts as well. Once I've done all of that, that's when I would go back in and type everything in the computer. Um, only because I do want to see the graph before I can figure out these intervals, okay? The domain's pretty easy. You know that the domain is always going to be negative infinity to infinity. The range is the one where you want to see the picture, okay? And it looks like I gave myself extra paper thinking I wasn't going to fit all of that in there, but I did. Okay, I'm um, coming up on 17 minutes, so I'm going to stop there, and then we'll come back and work on the next example.